Okay, so last class we were looking at uh, the uh, the distinction uh, distinction area in an arc, right? So the, we saw three regions. Okay, so what are the three regions we saw in an arc? Okay, so suppose if you have an arc. Okay, so you, you form an, a beautiful. Uh, so I'm not a good artist, so but still you can uh, imagine. So suppose if this is our uh, anode and this is cathode. So we see uh, just below the anode tip, we have anode fall zone, right? And then just above the cathode regions, we have cathode fall zone, right? Isn't it? And we looked at uh, the, di the distinctive characteristic of these zones. So we looked at in a, in a, in a anode fall zone, and because of uh, the positive uh, polarity, it attracts electrons. So electrons accumulate at the tip of the anode and form anode fall zone. And due to that, we have accumulation of electrons leading to uh, improper collisions. The collision is not complete. Okay, so the mutual energy exchange is not complete. Therefore, the electron temperatures are much higher at the anode, anode fall zone than elsewhere. Okay, because there is not enough energy exchange because the number density of electrons are much much higher than the ions. Okay, so that also leads to a voltage gradient. Right? Okay, so voltage gradient in anode fall zone. Similarly, a voltage gradient in cathode fall zone because of the accumulation of electrons at the surface of the cathode, and which we call it cathode fall zone. Okay, again in cathode fall zone, the gas temperatures are much higher, or gas uh, ions temperature are much higher than the electron temperature because again there is not enough en energy exchange between the electrons and ions, right? And uh, because of that, the gas temperature is always higher than the electron temperature, much higher, right? And we looked at the functions of cathode. So the the main function of cathode to emit electrons, right? So we looked at uh, the the cathode functions. So in subsequently we'll see the detail about the emissions, but we'll uh, uh, we, we have seen uh, the cathode emissions like thermionic process, thermionic emission, right? And we looked at the equation which governs the thermionic emissions, right? The, the electron density is without uh, referring your notebook. Can anyone tell? T square, e power, minus work function, yes, by yeah again Boltzmann. Okay, so the work function we defined uh, uh, as a work we do to emit an electron from a from a from a from a material from a, in this case for example cathode right so e is nothing but the charge and then phi is it's like an electron volt sorry so electron volt is again wha so what is one electron volt how many joules is one electron volt or one joule is how many electron volts first lesson Okay. So one joule is how many electron volts? So when do you say one joule? When one coulomb of electrons travel over one volt, right? When then then the, the, the energy gain. So obviously one joule is 6.242 times 10 power 18 electron volt. Okay, that is one coulomb, right? Number density, number of electrons in one coulomb. Isn't it? So it's all related. So if you say one joule is 6.242 times 10 power 18 electron volts, because that is what one coulomb we define, right? Number of electrons in one coulomb. Okay. If you say one electron volt, obviously, if you say one joule, it is obviously 6.24 into 10 power 18 electron volt, right? So that's what the work function is defines the energy joules in terms of joules right okay so that's the joule you need to give for creating an uh, one coulomb of uh, charge traveling through one joule of energy it's all simple later so the work function e phi is defines the energy so work function is again is, is a material parameter so for some material it, it is can be very high for some material it can be low and uh, we have to have a compromise between the melting point 
or the thermal stability of the cathode with respect to work function. Because in order to emit the thermionic emission in electrons by thermionic emission, you need to heat it up to higher temperature because T determines the emission, right. So we dope it with some oxides of a high melting point material or material which, which has high thermal stability so that now we can emit the electrons at a lower temperature or reasonably lower temperature by doping these materials with oxides because oxides are generally they have very low work function. And then we looked at the field emission because not always it is possible to emit electrons by thermionic emission because sometimes we use say consumable cathode. So in that case, so we need to emit electrons by some other way. So we use field emissions, high frequency. So it has to be done with a very high electric energy. So we go up to you know, 10 power 10 amperes per square meter to emit the electron by field emission, right? It is clear. So we looked at uh, the, the emission um, uh, mechanisms between uh, the, uh, the th thermionic emission and the field emissions and we will see in subsequent chapters uh, the how these emissions are used to ignite an arc, okay? Arc ignition is done by these two emissions, okay? So we will see when you want to ignite an arc how we can promote these two processes that will come in, uh, in subsequent chapters when you look at the process itself. So now before even going to that, we, want to, we have to study about the third region in this figure, so which is R column, so R column, right? So we just, just touched upon the R column. So the, the, the R column is uh, electrically neutral, okay, in, in general. So therefore, the voltage gradient is not steeper as compared to the anode or cathode fault zone. So why do you say the electrically neutral? Because the number density of the electrons and ions is more or less equal, okay. So when the R column becomes electrically neutral, we call that state as plasma, okay. So plasma is defined as a neutral state of matter, okay. So the arc when it becomes electrically neutral then it becomes plasma but then the number density must be equal. So we need to create as much electrons and ions in such a way that we maintain electrical neutrality. But it is very difficult to have attain that state in a welding case. So we will have to do some modification to the arc itself to make arc into plasma. So most of the arc welding processes, the arc is electrically negative because it contains more electrons than ions, right? But in a way, you can assume that you know uh, in, in, in a typical in, a, in a arc column, you know, of all the arc welding processes, the kinetic energies of these the charge carriers, the electrons and ions, are the same because there is a mutual collision. The number density is close to equal maybe slight negativity but you can say that the amount of the density of electrons and ions are so high, okay. So there will be a mutual collision between them leading to uh, an exchange of a complete exchange of energy between the electrons and ions. So therefore if you look at the kinetic energy of these space carriers, the charge carriers, it is equal. So if you say that you know, uh, so we were looking at uh, see one um, electron Okay, it must be equal to say for example ion as well anywhere. So must be equal to a kinetic energy of a particle as a function of temperature can be determined by 3 by 2 Boltzmann again, right? It is clear. So now we will go in even deeper. So when you say that it has an equal energy, that means that there is a mutual collision, okay? So the mutual collision ensures that the complete energy action like in a snooker ball, okay. So that means that so when the electron um, the heats an ion, the electron stops if there is a complete exchange of energy, okay. And then ion is carrying the energy of electrons and travels further. So that is the complete mutual collision and exchange of energy, okay. But it is not always the case, right. So because the, the electrons uh, carry very, very low mass compared to iron. So iron is nothing but as a gas atom, 
okay, where it, it has one or two electrons lesser than the complete shell it used to have. So, the mass of ion is much much higher than the electrons. Okay, so, ideally technically if an electrical neutrality is maintained, if a mutual collision happens then the electron temperature must be equal to gas temperature, is not it? Right? So, that is complete energy exchange system, it is an equilibrium, it is an electrically neutral and thermal equilibrium, system is in under thermal equilibrium as well. Okay, so, so, this is the ideal state we can have. So, when you define, when you say this plasma, that means that all the subatomic particles, atomic particles, these charge carriers should have a same temperature and the number density should be such a way that you maintain electrical neutrality. So, that is the state of plasma, right. So, that means that it, it is it like in any other matter. Right? So, it does not have any electrical uh, charge, net electrical charge and all the entities, microscopic entities have same temperature. So, that is plasma, but in our case because again the electrons are slightly higher in number density okay, and uh, the drift velocity of electrons are much higher than the ions. What is drift velocity? For example, after the collision in between two collisions because of the low mass they can travel much further than the ions, is not it? Yes, the electrons carry low, low mass compared to ions. So, the, the average drift velocity between two collisions will be much higher for electrons, right? So, if the electron drift velocity is higher obviously, it, it is also exposed in the system for higher time, more time, is not it? So, they can travel far between two collisions because of the high drift velocity given by the low mass, therefore the electrons can heat up slightly more, right. So, the electron temperature is slightly always higher than the ion temperature in the system at atmospheric pressure, okay. So, if you look at uh, the curves at one atmosphere pressure, it is more or less equal. You look at the sign I, I drew, okay, I was so careful not to make any mistake because it is not equal it is more or less equal, okay. So, the, the electron temperature is more or less equal to gas temperature at what atmosphere pressure it is the case, okay. So, you can assume, so between 18000 Kelvin to 18500 Kelvin you would say it is equal, right, is not it? We want, you want distinguish 500 Kelvin when the temperature is already close to 20000 Kelvin. So, that is the case at atmospheric pressure the electron temperature is slightly higher than ion and gas temperatures. But when the pressure is changed, when the system is under different pressures then the situation is not going to hold because then your drift velocity will change. If you change the pressure, your drift velocity will change. Suppose if you are going to low pressure, so obviously the effect of pressure on the mass is so high the electrons would drift even much faster at low pressure situation, then the electron temperature will increase even further compared to ions, right, it is clear. So, at atmospheric pressure more or less equal you can say, but when the pressure is increased or pressure is decreased then drift velocity will also change dramatically, okay. So, if you are doing welding at one atmosphere you can assume that T e the temperature of the electrons are more or less equal to the gas electrons and these are important. Why these concepts are important? Because I am going to teach you when you look at the heat generation. So, then you need to understand all these phenomena when you are looking at uh, deriving the equation for electrical conductivity of an arc which is needed because conductivity determines your heat generation resistivity 1 by conductivity reciprocal of conductivity, is not it? So, when you are deriving equations for that you need to understand these concepts. Okay. okay, so we will move on for this class. The R column again to recall they consist of neutral as well as charge particles. Okay. Obviously, the electrons and ions would move to respective uh, the, uh, the uh, electrodes or respective the polarity to either to an anode or cathode 
based on their charges, electrons travel towards anodes, ions will travel towards cathode. And because of uh, the number density, equal number of uh, positive and negative charge carriers, you maintain electric neutrality. Once you achieve that electric neutrality, you can claim that you created a plasma, right? And because of the mutual collisions between the electrons and ions, it ensures the local thermal equilibrium, okay? So, so the temperature of electrons and gas temperature are more or less equal. And if you achieve uh, such state, it is uh, a an, an, uh, clear equilibrium state of plasma where your plasma reached the electrically neutral and the thermal equilibrium system, okay. In that system, the kinetic energy of all the particles are the same which is equal to 3 by 2 kT, is clear? Good. But it is not always the case, right? So you have because of the difference in mass the electrons drift more or they travel more because of the mass the drift velocity is also higher leading to the electrons are heated slightly more than the gas in the system. So at one atmosphere pressure the electron temperature are slightly higher than the gas temperature, okay. So at atmospheric, what is atmospheric pressure in the Newton per square meter? If you change the pressure of the system what happens? the drift velocity of the electrons also change, okay. So obviously at lower pressures, if you look at it, the electron drift velocity will be much higher at low pressures. Obviously, the difference will increase because the gas, because of the mass, the effect of pressures will be significant when the mass is changed. For example, lighter mass materials would have a higher velocities at low pressures than the heavier mass and that can lead to the change in drift velocity at lower pressures. And because of that, so you will have uh, the electrons gaining uh, uh, more temperature than the gas ions. So the difference will, will be significant at, uh, at lower pressures. Yes, it is clear? Any questions? Okay. So we will move on further in the arc column. What happens in the arc column? Okay, so this is what I explained. So at what atmosphere pressure, temperature is more or less equal, but always the electron temperature you should be careful is slightly higher than the gas temperatures because electrons are lighter and they have a longer free path because of the high drift velocity. So that they can spend more time and before the energy exchange, which is the collision. Okay, so that they are heated up higher. Right? It's clear. <coughs> so when you say that there is an energy created in the system by the collisions of the ions and the electrons, so obviously that energy has to be consumed, isn't it? So suppose if you want to calculate how much energy is generated, we can calculate that by looking at how this energy is spent. Okay, so if you know how you spend that energy, then we know that how much energy is already there before we begin with. Okay? Suppose if you spend all your pocket money in a day, if you know that how much money you spend, if you sum up, sum it up and you get it how much money you had to begin with, right? So same thing. So when you want to calculate how much energy is generated in an arc, we can calculate it by knowing how much energy is transferred to the system. So when you have uh, an uh, energy is there, obviously the energy is transferred in this case by three ways, right? By conduction, convection and radiation, right? So that is how the energy is spent. So by looking at uh, how the, the, the heat is con conducted from the arc and how it is actually transferred by convection radiation and we can also know how much energy is created in the system, but it is not that straightforward, okay? So this experiment we carried out to look at how much temperature is, the, what would be the temperature distribution of an arc. So this is a real experimental data. So it is done using a, a 200 amperes current of a tungsten thoriated electrode, okay, in argon atmosphere. And this anode is a copper plate which is water cooled 
copper plate. So it's fully cooled. So when you look at the temperature distribution typical at what atmosphere, okay. So again, so at the center of the arc, the temperature can go up to 18,000 Kelvin. Someone asked a question in last class. Suppose if you are having an, an, a metal electrode here, is, is cathode here is in tungsten, and system is exposed to a temperature of 18,000 Kelvin, won't it melt? It won't, right? You see in real life in gas, gas tungsten arc welding, the electrode tip is stable, right? Why it's not molten? Yeah, it's, it's obviously a melting point. Okay. So you the temperature you see that in the center here, it can go up to 18,000 Kelvin. But still, you have the tip not molten, right? And because of the the, the formation of uh, the cathode fault zone. So when you have when you say that the arc, the arc column, it starts from in this case cathode fault zone. Cathode fault zone is very tiny area. 10 power minus 8, 10 power minus 7. That is what you are exposing. Okay, and this this tungsten is conducting heat very effectively as well as the exposure is very towards very tiny area okay and similarly when you are doing non consumable electrode welding you make sure that electrons are moved away that means that electrons carry heat come more heat than ions okay so the heat is uh, carried away by electrons very effectively from the tip which is very tiny already 10 power minus 8 so you don't melt because of the effective conduction as well as the electrons are not reaching the electrodes the heat is effectively transferred by the electrons okay towards anode in this case so anode is molten right because the electrons are reaching the anodes which carry the heat right it's clear okay now if you look at the temperature distribution obviously at the center of the the arc column it's the temperature can go up to 18,000 Kelvin. The arc envelope, what you call it is the, the outer periphery is known as arc envelope okay, and it can go up to 10,000 Kelvin. So the temperature of the arc is entirely determined by the nature of the gas what you have which is forming the arc. Why is that? Because the gas determines the ionization okay so if you want to understand what is happening inside the arc and how we generate these temperatures then we need to understand the first basic principle of the generation of the, the, the charge carriers of course the thermionic emission the field emission they just ignite the arc okay so they supply enough electrons to the system so that these electrons which are generated from the cathode can trigger now the subsequent sustained discharge which is ionization yes it's clear so before going to look at the heat balance first we need to understand how these charge carriers are created right it's clear because that is going to determine the temperature distribution the temperature is arising from the collisions, the, the heat which is generated in the arc. Yes? Okay. So, first we will let understand the basic principle, basic fundamental process that is happening which is ionization. Right? So, when you say the ionization, so what is ionization? We need to define again, right? Okay. So, this is simple. When you say ionization, it is nothing but it is a process of removing one electron okay, from an atom and in this process you generate an electron right? and uh, the, the atom becomes a positive ion. Right? So that does not happen by itself. Okay? You need to always supply an energy to an atom so that you knock out an electron same as thermionic emission in thermionic emission you have work function whereas in here you have ionization energy 
right? You supply an energy which is an ionization energy because you are creating an ion, okay? So that you knock out an electron from an atom, okay? So this is the very basic reaction helps in sustaining the discharge. So, so you pump up electrons by thermionic emissions, okay? So those electrons subsequently, once they attain the energy equal to the ionization energy, then obviously that electron can trigger the ionization in subsequent reactions, okay? So once the electrons which is emitted by thermionic emission, they attain the energy equal to ionization energy, then they subsequently knock out subsequent electrons from the shell of an and the gas atom, okay? So this reaction is endothermic or exothermic? Endothermic. endothermic because you supply energy, right? So this energy is consumed by the atom to release an electron. Yes, it's clear. So the, the EI again, it is a function of the material. In this case, a function of gas because EI can be changed if you change the composition of the gas or the nature of the gas, right? It's clear. So the degree of ionization, suppose if you want to calculate how much amount of ion you generate at a given temperature, you can use this equation. It is a very famous equation. An arc is, is, is a beautiful star, okay? So if you know that what gas you are using it and you know the ionization energy, right? And you get the spectrum and spectrum is not constant, it changes, okay? From the middle of the arc column to the envelope, if you accurately predict the spectrum, you can calculate the temperature, isn't it? Right? It's clear. So for yeah. What is the P? What could be P here? It is pressure. Okay. So what are muscle pressure? P goes away. Right? So if you change the P, the pressure, obviously you also change the the fraction ionized. Okay. So it is negligible at one atmosphere pressure. But it is not the case, right? In arc, we can neglect P. Arc pressure is based on the curve I showed you already, okay? So if you keep the pressure constant, the only thing is going to affect your ionization fraction. So again, alpha is the fraction ionized or degree of ionization. This is nothing but the degree of ionization over the unionized gas atoms. So That's a fraction. Okay, so total or the unionized with the ionized fraction is again this is constant and EI is the ionization energy, right? So your pressure is constant, the only thing which is dependent on is the temperature. Or in other word, if a gas has high ionization energy, then the temperature should be increased in order to ionize. Okay, it is clear. So if you look at the function of the ionization energy as a fraction ionized, obviously if you have a very high ionization energy, you need to increase the temperature to much higher. Then only you can create ions, Saga equation. Saga equation defines the shape of this curve, includes the exponential decay. Okay, so that is what the, 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 the exponent here is doing, a negative sign here. Okay, so the equation determines the shape of this curve, right? It's clear. If you look at thermionic emission, it's similar equation, isn't it? At square e power minus work function divided by kT. That's also you are emitting an electron. Here also you are emitting an electron. There is work function, here is ionization energy, okay? The nature of the curve, this exponential decay is similar as a function of temperature, isn't it? Yeah? 
So, this curve when you fit it you will get Saga equation okay. So, this curve if you fit so you will get a, a, a Saga equation and the, what does the curve say for example if you have very high energy uh, the ionization energy if you want to create say for example uh, half of uh, uh, the gas atoms would be ionized 50 percent ionization in this case. So, you need to increase somewhere about 11,000 11, Kelvin. The gas temperature will be increased 11,000 Kelvin if your ionization energy is somewhere 9 electron volt. Okay. So, if a gas has a very low ionization energy obviously, you can ionize the half of the gas atoms at much lower temperature 6000 Kelvin. Okay. In other words, if you say that the heat is emitted in terms of heat generation, okay, that means that suppose if you are giving an energy to the system, so obviously when the gas has a very low ionization energy, you also create low temperatures, isn't it? Whereas if you ionize the gases with high ionization energy, you also create more heat, more temperatures, isn't it? It's the same. You are telling differently, right? So gases with low ionization energy can ionize that with low temperatures. Okay. In other words, if a gas is with low ionization energy, when they get ionized, the temperature of the system is also low, isn't it? So, when you use uh, uh, for example, a uh, helium as a ceiling gas, helium has helium has the, the highest ionization energy. Okay. So, when you use helium as a shielding gas, when you ionize helium, obviously the system temperature should also be very high. Obviously, arc temperature will also be very high. Right? Suppose if you are uh, ionizing in a vapor, metal vapor. Okay, and metal vapor has generally very low ionization energy. So, then the arc temperature would also decrease or it will be very low compared to when you have a system where you have a helium or argon for that matter. Yes, it is clear? Good. And this curve is clear, right? So, this is nothing but Saga equation.